Okay, I think we can start. We can start. So, hello everybody. We are here in the Latin American American of Physics, and my name is Roberto Lideros, and I, I am from the Institute of Physical Popular in Valencia, and I will be the host of this the webinar. So today is going to be a very, we are going to have a very interesting webinar because it's about phenomenology or things and among physics. But before we start, let me just to give some announcement. In this case, that uh, uh, you can make questions and uh, the Q and A, past Q and A, part of the of the session following the. The, the streaming, the, the streaming. And, and also you can also you can make in the Twitter with the hashtag the hashtag you see also here in the, the, the experience of here. Here. so so and also, and also this is very important very because important we have because differences, differences with respect to what we were doing last, last year this time we have a work space which also appearing so here the, the, the information about the mental where in this website we are gonna centralize all the information about the web we can find all the information plus the announcements and everything. So I guess trying to the speaker of today is gonna be Alejandro de la Puente. He's a postdoc research associate in the Carlton University in Canada. But before he did a PhD in in physics in the University of Notre Dame in the United States, and after that he did a postdoc in Triumph in Vancouver. So uh, the title of his talk is uh, Compressing the Inner Dark, Inner Doublet Model, sorry. And I guess if you're ready, uh, Alejandro, you can you can start. So how okay. are you? Yeah, very you good. Thank you for yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to, that uh, this is being done for people that you know and want to share their work and cannot travel much. So, so I'm looking forward to the talk, and I hope you all enjoy it. So, let me let me put the talk up mm -hmm. and share the screen. Let's see. Okay. So, okay. Is can you see it now? No, for the moment we don't see the presentation. You see your webcam. Ah. Okay, hold on. Sorry. We're presenting to everyone. It says I'm sharing the screen, so. Ah, sorry. There we go. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, now we see it. Okay, so I, now I'm ready to start. Okay. So, like I said, like uh, Roberto said, I, I'll be talking. Uh, today about the uh, one of these most uh, studied models in phenomenology up to date. It's been very well studied, but I'm going to study a very particular limit of this model that uh, gives interest in phenomenology and that has escaped a lot of the the direct constraint, direct direct detection um, efforts that have been done on this model. So this is an interesting model because uh, we will be able to probe it in this limit. With future colliders and maybe a run to LHC with very high luminosity. Um, so the the, the 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 work was done with uh, uh, my colleagues in Vancouver uh, with Nikita Vlinov, Jonathan Kosaksuk, and David Morrissey, um, and it's based on a paper that is actually almost uh, in physical review. Uh, we just have to finish some uh, uh, reviews. So. So let me just give you a little outline of what I'll be talking to you about. Uh, first, I'm just going to kind of uh, go over the NRW model, which probably most of you already know. Uh, then I will tell you how you can naturally uh, get small mass splittings between the exotic scalars of this model. Uh, and then I will go over some basic bounds that uh, needs, needs to, need to be addressed in order to 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 have to look at the viability of this model up to date, so electroweak and Higgs bounds in particular. Then I will tell you about um, uh, whether or not this model predicts a good dark matter candidate that is consistent with indirect direct dark matter constraints and um, also indirect dark matter constraints. And then I will tell you about the current and projected LHC constraints. Um, and then. Um, also, what um, a future a higher energy collider can do about searching for this model. So, 
Let me start with a little uh, review of the inert doublet model. Uh, so the inert doublet model is basically a, a, an extension of the standard model that contains an additional uh, electroweak uh, complex scalar uh, uh, Higgs doublet. Uh, the, 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 the important feature of this model is that this, uh, uh, this new Higgs doublet, it's, uh, it's parity odd under a, 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 a discrete set to uh, symmetry. And uh, if you want this Z2 symmetry to remain unbroken, then you have to arrange the parameters so that only H1 gets a VEB. So only the standard model uh, Higgs uh, complex W will get a VEB. And uh, this is very important because that will allow you to generate no mixing between the Higgses. So in, um, in a way, um, the phenom phenomenology of the Higgs that we have observed in 2012 and that we've confirmed almost completely, or that we are still confirming it's it's pretty much a standard model like. And it doesn't get modified uh, that much, but I will tell you about ways it could be modified um, very, uh, very small in, in small amounts. Um, also, this this particular symmetry is it's, it's, it's relevant because uh, if it's unbroken, uh, you don't have direct couplings of the uh, of this new exotic uh, scalar doublet to fermions, and this is important because most of the phenomenology will depend on how this exotic scalar couples to the standard model Higgs and to gauge bosons. Um, so um, then, uh, the, the last nice feature about this model is that because this set to, set to symmetry will remain unbroken by construction, the lightest scalar uh, that is not uh, electromagnetically charged, whether it's H or A, a CP uh, even or a CP other scalar, will uh, most likely uh, be a good dark matter uh, candidate because it will be a stable uh, cosmology. So this model has been uh, very well studied, um, and it was first originally proposed by the uh, Anders Pande and Ma, uh, Ernest Ma, in, in the 70s. And since then, people have done a lot of work and studied many different aspects of this model. First, Barbieri, Hall, and Rikoff have studied whether this model can um, increase the naturalness of the standard model. Uh, this was before, you know, we found a, a 126 GeV Higgs. Um, people have also used this model to investigate deviations in the properties of the Higgs boson. Um, also, this model gives you very nice signatures with missing energy, so people have studied that, uh, uh, that aspect of the model, and also because this model can give you a, a good uh, phase transition and induce electroweak biogenesis which can address the fact that we see more variants and antivariants um, in the universe today. So uh, with that said, um, I'm going to study a, a very particular limit of this model, which is still uh, very interesting because uh, it has escaped a lot of bounds. Uh, so basically, an inert to Higgs doublet model it can be characterized by the following um, potential, uh, scalar potential, that it's um, um, invariant under a, a shift uh, where H2 goes to negative H2, so a discrete set to uh, parity. So the most general potential is given by the following uh, equation. And as you can see, you have the additional uh, couplings that do not appear in the standard model, such as lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, and lambda 5. In this uh, model, because the set to parity is unbroken, the uh, Higgs doublet that corresponds to the Higgs and the exotic Higgs tablet do not mix. And so the mass of the standard model Higgs is just as in the standard model. So it's 4 lambda 1 times the web square, where V is 174 GV. And then the three other uh, exotic scalars, one CP even, one CP odd, and two charged scalars, they depend on uh, mu 2 and then the other parameters of the model, which are the mixing lambda 3, lambda 4, and lambda 5. OK? So what I'm going to discuss today is whether there is a natural way to make these three scalars um, degenerate or close to degenerate, OK? So the first thing you should note is that if you uh, extend the Z2 symmetry uh, by a global U1 acting on H2, then you can naturally set lambda 5 equal to 0. And that will automatically lead to a degenerate uh, CP even and CP odd scalar, OK? This is uh, basically uh, the idea of a Petschy queen symmetry in a way. OK, uh, um, and it's also relevant. This, this is an important symmetry, as I will tell you in, the, in, a, in another slide, uh, because this symmetry is non-anomalous, OK? Uh, 
Another uh, symmetry that you can extend the Z2 by is a, uh, a global SU2 just acting on H2. And uh, this symmetry uh, will give you uh, lambda 4 and lambda 5 equals 0. And uh, this will lead to all three exotic scalars uh, being degenerate. Okay? So MH, MA, and MH plus will have the same mass. Um, in the limit of a small lambda 4 and lambda 5, the splittings between the neutral scalars will just be proportional to lambda 5. So as lambda 5 goes to 0, the splitting goes to 0. And the splitting between the charge component and the, uh, uh, the CP even one is proportional to the sum of lambda 4 over lambda 5. So if either lambda 4 or lambda 5 go to 0, that's not enough to render this, um, this uh, splitting small. But you know, lambda 5 is set to 0. Lambda 4 could be small. So there are many ways to have this splitting be small in a natural way by imposing a SU2 uh, global symmetry. Um, However, um, like I said, a vanishing lambda 5 is actually technically natural because this global U1 acting on H2 commutes with all the, uh, with, um, uh, all the gauge symmetries of the standard model. So this U1 is non-anomalous. That means that um, the running of, on lamb of lambda 5 will basically just be proportional to lambda 5. So if lambda 5 is equal to some number at a higher scale, uh, it will, it will it will, uh, sorry, if lambda 5 is equal to 0, so it vanishes at some high scale, it will vanish at all the scales below that. However, lambda 4 and lambda 5 um, uh, cannot be completely set to 0 together in a, in, a, in a consistent way because ESU2 actually, it's broken when you gauge uh, the standard model gauge symmetry, the SU2 cross U1. So let me show you how that works. So the running of uh, lambda 4 is basically proportional to g squared g prime square, OK? And, um, and, and this, you, can, you can actually see this because this SU2 symmetry could be an extension of the custodial symmetry of the standard model. Okay? And this is being well studied. So you, we know that the SU2 custodial, um, it's, uh, it's, it's broken by, 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 by the hypercharge. So the same thing happens. In, uh, with, with this SU2 global symmetry, the running of lambda 4, which goes to 0 when you impose an exact global symmetry, actually it's generated at some lower scale because its running is proportional to g squared um, at times g prime squared. So the SU2 left and the U1y are couplings. And lambda 5, as, as I already said, is actually just proportional to lambda 5. So lambda 5 could be set to 0 in a very natural way and it will remain 0, but lambda 4 cannot uh, be set to 0 and it will remain 0. So that has a very important um, implications for what you can do with this model because uh, one idea of, 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 of model building is to not generate um, you know, more fine tunings that you, that, that you already have. Um, so uh, for example, in, in the plot here on the right, uh, what I'm showing is uh, in the y-axis, you have lambda 4 at some uh, lo a high input scale as a function of the high input scale, the, lo the, the logarithm uh, of that high input scale. And I've chosen uh, lambda 2, lambda 3, and lambda 5 at the, at the mass of the, of the Z, so at the electroweak scale, to be 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0. And I've chosen a, 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 a CP even exotic scalar mass of 100 GV. So this plot basically tells you uh, with the, these dashed lines correspond to a mass splitting of, of a charge mass splitting of uh, 1 GeV, okay? And the coloring gives you a larger splitting between mi minus 10 and 15. So basically, um, what this plot tells you is that if you want to have a, a lambda 4 uh, that vanishes at some high input scale and uh, to remain close to zero at the electroweak scale, you really need to fine tune your model very much uh, at, the, at the high input scale or have a new physics appear very close to the electroweak scale, okay? So um, with that said, um, in order to avoid some large degree of fine tuning in this model, you want to stick to values of the charge mass splitting that are, you know, close to or above 1 GeV, okay? And that's to keep the model sort of uh, very, very, uh, 
finely fine tuned, so not not largely fine tuned. Now the mass splitting with respect to the two with the two scalars, the CP even and the CP odd, that could be z to zero. But as we will see later on, there are some limits on, on how that can on how small that can be. But for all purposes, you can set that uh, you can set these two scalars to be degenerate, and you you will have a technically natural theory. Um, so so. What I will discuss in the in, in, in the remaining of the talk is I will I will talk about what is the phenomenology of having a compressed spectrum. So when the two scalars are very close to degenerate and the charge mass splitting is above one GeV. But in particular, I'm going to focus at mass splitting between one and five GeV, and I'm going to give you uh, results for masses uh, of these uh, scalars between uh, what's allowed the lowest it's allowed by. Uh, let's say zero for now, and then up to uh, 500 GeV. But uh, in order to kind of probe these guys at colliders, we want to uh, really focus on masses up to 100 GeV. Now, a degenerate uh, spectrum uh, can render well, some of these guys are uh, very long lived, and if they're very long lived, uh, except for the the lightest one, which will be completely stable. Uh, the next to lightest could be long-lived, and that can have implications for um, big bang nucleosynthesis, and it can have implications in colliders because um, you will um, these guys will be produced and they will live for an amount of time. That amount of time could be large enough that these guys escape the detector and they appear just as missing energy. Or that amount of time could be uh, small enough to leave um, a displaced vertex at the LHC that you can actually reconstruct by looking at the decay products and. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on displaced vertices in the last two, three years. And uh, the LHC, the machine, the, the two detectors are getting much better at reconstructing uh, secondary, tertiary, and uh, vertices as a whole. So uh, it's very interesting to look at long-lived particles. But I'm not going to focus much about that, but I will show you a plot on how long-lived these guys can be. Uh, so this basically tells you, you know, uh, the, the, the lifetime of these uh, scalars as a function of the mass splitting. So the red line corresponds to, uh, and uh, this is considering H, uh, the exotic scalar, to be the lightest particle without loss of generality. So A will be the next to lightest. And so in, in, in this case, uh, the red line depicts how A will decay to H. And it will decay to H uh, as Z boson, and then the Z boson will decay to fermions. Um, so depending on the mass splitting, you can have a particle, an A particle, that is very long lived. But if you want it to be prompt at the collider level, you want sort of a lifetime or a C tau, which is on the order of one millimeter or below that. Right? And for those uh, values of, uh, of your lifetime, you want mass splittings that are on the order of anywhere between um, 500 MeV and above that. Um, for the charge mass splittings, as I already said, um, focusing on values below 1 GeV uh, renders a model which is fine-tuned. So the charged particle, just by construction and by 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 imposing naturalness and sorry, by imposing uh, very little fine-tuning, then the, the H plus will naturally just be a stable. No, not sorry. It will it will be prompt. Uh, it will decay within the detector with lifetimes above one millimeter. Um, so. I'm not going to focus on long-lived particles, but you know, as I will show you later on, there is phase space where A could be long-lived, and that could have interesting implications, and we can study that in future future work. Um, so, what are some of the bounds or one constraints that have already put bounds on how much uh, on how large this splitting can be? Uh, the most uh, important basic bound, I'll call it basic, uh, because it's, it's based on data that's been taken for years at LEP and at the LHC, is how how large it could contribute to the oblique parameters. Uh, in particular, this model um, contributes uh, very largely to the to the to the to the t parameter. The s parameter is, it depends on the masses logarithmically and is not so large, but the contribution to the delta t. Is uh, proportional to actually the mass splitting. So in the degenerate limit, the contribution to delta t will be small. Okay, but uh, let's just for the sake of for the sake of, of talking, let's say well, you know what 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 will happen in a model with two Higgs doublets um, and a large Higgs mass below we found the Higgs. Well, you will need 
a very a very large delta t because as you increase the Higgs mass, uh, you start going away uh, to smaller delta t in the electroweak fit. So actually, this model is very good. If we hadn't discovered the Higgs and we discovered a Higgs that was larger in mass, say let's say 500 GeV, then this model can actually fix that because it will give you a positive delta t contribution. But in our case, in the compressed limit. Delta T is it's small enough so that it doesn't really constrain the model. Okay. Uh, the second basic bound is uh, basically uh, how the Z will decay to uh, these new exotics. And because the Z is a CP um, odd um, particle, it will decay to uh, a CP even Higgs and a CP odd Higgs. Okay. And people have studied this uh, in, uh, very, very well. Uh, there is a decay process that has been measured well at LEP, and this is a Z decaying to um, two fermions and two neutrinos, and it's basically a standard model background to this decay, a Z decaying to MH and MA. Now, that decay basically gives you a background of roughly three events. So, um, in order to actually be okay with, uh, with this, this bounds, which predict a very small uh, uh, back, standard model background, you will like to stay above uh, the, the the kinematic threshold. So you will you will want to stay. Be, uh, you will want your mass of your exotic CP even and your exotic CP odd, uh, the sum of that to be above the mass of the Z. Uh, you can arrange the masses so that this you know the the sum is less, but that will give you a certain hierarchy on the two masses, and you really again it, it will be you can call that a prediction. But in order to kind of have more accessibility to parameter space, we choose the sum to be greater than mz, and we go from there. So from now on, we're going to focus our analysis on masses of mh plus ma above the mass of the z. Okay. Um, the uh, second, um, the third uh, basic bound that I want to discuss is Higgs decays to exotics. And uh, now that we've measured a uh, uh, we, we know there is a Higgs and it's 126. Now we're, we're, we're in the business of trying to measure its, its branching ratios uh, precisely. But there's still uh, uh, sort of a large, large, um, large room for, for new physics there uh, because you can arrange um, the couplings in such a way so that uh, the, the properties of the Higgs that we have measured do not change. And, um, but if you want to um, be OK with uh, with the invisible decay width of the Higgs, or what's allowed, what what the Higgs is allowed to decay that is not a standard model like for now on, it, that puts uh, strong constraints on the sum of the couplings lambda three plus lambda four plus lambda five. Now, this is assuming that uh, the standard model Higgs only decays to two CP even exotics. To face space for the, the Higgs to decay to two CP odds or two charged exotics, then that will put constraints on the other uh, combinations of the parameters. So, for example. If H to AA is allowed, then you have a constraint on lambda 3 plus lambda 4 minus lambda 5 over 2. And if it, the H to H plus H minus is allowed, then you have a constraint on lambda 3, okay? Because the uh, the coupling between the, the charge component and the standard model Higgs is proportional to lambda 3. But, you know, if, if you just, you know, set MH to be 60 GeV or 10 GeV, then you have basically the sum to be less than 0 0.012 or 0 0.07. Okay, then this... This is an easily avoidable um, um, constraint in the um, in the degenerate in the compressed limit, so we don't worry much about this. But um, as I will show later, lambda three is very much like lambda four, as that its coupling runs with uh, with gauge coupling. So lambda three um, can be uh, small but not too small because if it's zero at some high energy scale it will be generated at the low energy scale and it will be generated basically mainly by gauge couplings in the limit that all the other couplings are small so lambda 3 you know might not it cannot be naturally too small okay and you can see that better in uh, when when uh, you look at um, um, how the the Higgs will decay the charge Higgs will decay to two photons okay so that puts actually a bound on lambda three um, needs to be less than or equal to one. So this is basically when you have a Higgs decay into two photons through a loop of charge Higgs. Okay. So um, these are the basic bounds that I wanted to discuss. So 
just what I want you to get out of this slide is that um, Lambda 3 cannot be that big, otherwise you'll start running into uh, problems with uh, Higgs precision measurements. Okay. And uh, yeah. So now let me tell you a little bit about uh, the dark matter story of the compressed region. Um, the dark matter story is we, we uh, with our loss of generality, we're going to assume that uh, the CP even guy is the, uh, the lightest one, and it will be a good dark matter candidate because it will be stable. Um, but the nice thing about the degenerate limit is that you have a lot of room for co-annihilations, and that will suppress uh, the relic abundance in, in this model. So actually, it works against you in a way in places where you might get the relic abundance, coannihilations will basically suppress that. So uh, coannihilations play an important role. And um, then I will show you where you can have um, a good dark matter candidate. Uh, as I already said, it's natural to consider a small neutral splitting because of lambda 5 being naturally 0. But we're going to keep delta plus, minus, uh, delta plus minus above 1 GeV. Um, so here are some, uh, now uh, the, the way we, we, we calculate the dark matters, we vary delta plus minus and also lambda L, which controls the coupling of HH annihilating to standard model particles through the Higgs portal, okay? So it's basically lambda 3 plus lambda 4 plus lambda 5 over 2. So we vary those two parameters and we keep the neutral mass splitting below 1 GeV, okay? Just slightly below 1 GeV. Uh, now, if lambda 4 and lambda 5 are small enough, then lambda L is basically proportional to lambda 3 over 2. And as I already told you, Higgs physics tells you that lambda 3 cannot be that big. Okay? So basically, when you look at these two plots, um, lambda lefts, which are close to 1, those guys will kind of be in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the place where, they, where the Higgs can decay to two exotic scalars, well, where is MH over, when, when the exotic scalar is MH over 2, the mass of the Higgs over 2, then you will want to have lambda L below uh, 1, let's say. Um, but in, in all other places, um, lambda 3 could, uh, could be large enough, that, uh, large enough so you can get the right relic abundance. So there's a couple of things I want to show you about this plot. So just where co-annihilations with, uh, with the charge Higgs are important. So that's on the left, uh, the blue line on the left. So when the charge is split in delta plus minus, it's a small, let's say 0.1 GeV. Co-annihilations with H, uh, the cross-section is very large, and that very much suppresses uh, the relic abundance. So the dashed line is the correct relic abundance as measured by Planck. Uh, there is also regions where you have these uh, particles you know, you have annihilation through a resonance, right? So you have a co-annihilation of H with A. So this is very important in the region where MH is equal to the mass of that Z over 2, right? And here all, all, all curves will collapse and they will basically uh, drop and you will not get the right relic abundance. And this also happens when you have a Higgs funnel. So when the mass, is, uh, when the mass of the exotics, the sum of the mass of the exotic scalar is equal to the mass of the Higgs. Okay, and then above masses of 100 GeV, the annihilation is mostly through gauge bosons, right? Sorry, the, the annihilation is into gauge bosons. So you have two dark matter particles annihilating through a, through a Higgs, through a standard model Higgs, into gauge bosons on or off shell, one or the, both of them. So you have two, three, four body decays, and all of them have been implemented. And you end up getting the right, right uh, relic abundance for masses close to 500 GeV. So unfortunately, we cannot get the relic abundance for masses uh, below 100 and above mz over 2. Uh, and, but that's just a feature of the degenerate limit where correlations are very important and to suppress your relic abundance. Uh, not to say that this, this, is not, this is a model that doesn't need to account for all the dark matter, but it, if it were to account for all the dark matter, it would fail in that aspect. Um, Again, another, another aspect that we need to study are dark matter direct detection, and these are basically spin-independent scattering. Um, so here are the two plots I want to show you. Um, and I just want to point out that uh, the mass splitting between the two neutral exotics cannot be below 200 keV. So here we have a lower bound now how small this, this uh, splitting can be, and this is because there is a very large inelastic uh, scattering with the nuclear where you know, the exotic H scatters with the nuclei and then a pseudo-scalar gets emitted. Um, 
and this is also being very well studied, but it's very large, so in order for it to not be so large, you have to have a mass splitting that is above 200 kV at least. Okay, so as you can see, um, uh, basically, direct detection constraints, um, you are okay with them in the region between MZ over 2 and 100 GeV. Uh, if your um, lambda L is not too large, okay? So basically, because lambda L con controls the Higgs coupling to the exotics, the standard model Higgs coupling to the exotics. So uh, to be consistent with LAX, you have to have a lambda L, which is roughly below 0.1. Uh, these curves have already been uh, multiplied by the, uh, the 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 amount of dark matter they pr the amount of dark matter they produce so the density of dark matter so they've been properly normalized also. Um, okay, so now let me tell you about collider limits. Um, the first uh, collider limits that need to be addressed are the ones from LEP. Um, LEP uh, run for a, a long time and uh, they look for uh, Higgses standard model or not uh, very uh, very much. So uh, here are the dominant production modes of these two scalars. You have E plus E minus going to H A through a, through a Z. Um, and you have H plus E plus E minus going to H plus H minus uh, through a X, uh, through a Z as well. So um, what we did is we fully recasted limits uh, from Delphi, which uh, we, we, we use Delphi because they provide the most information regarding acceptances and 95% uh, confidence limits. So we fully recasted their searches for neutralinos, you know, light is neutralino and next to light is neutralino, okay? And we actually uh, recasted the work done by Landstrom, Gustafsson, and Edsho, who do a very in-depth uh, recast of uh, LHC limits, and uh, we find that there is no improvement over the Z decay bound for delta zero less than 8 GeV. So if our neutral mass splittings are below 8 GeV, um, really LEP cannot really constrain um, this model at all. So in the degenerate limit that we are interested in, LEP cannot really rule out uh, any mass, any masses of H and A, okay? Uh, in order to put bounds on H plus A minus, H plus H minus, uh, we actually had to look at the experimental papers because there was no complete reinterpretation of lab searches for chi 1 plus chi 1 minus. So what we did, it's um, we, uh, we, we used the most complete lab search by Opal, and here's the paper that looks for H plus A, H minus in a very general way, not really in the, comp actually this search is not sensitive to the compressed regime, but we still did it just to see for any charge mass splitting what uh, what uh, uh, Lab has to say about this model, and we found constraints to be uh, less um, constraining than those for supersymmetry, and that's because uh, production cross sections for scalars are slightly smaller. I think I ran out of time, right? But let me finish. Anyway. No, you are okay with the time. Oh, oh okay. okay. No Sorry. Uh, then we also uh, recasted an OPPO search in the compressed region, okay? Uh, and this, this search actually searches for soft, uh, soft charge tracks uh, uh, from the production, from the decays of uh, the gauge bosons. So basically looks for missing energy and soft charge tracks from the decays of, of, of a Z, sorry, of a W. And uh, in order to uh, actually get constraints out of this, we use the efficiencies for hexenolite charge genomes. And this is because it's really hard to uh, actually simulate the uh, lab detectors nowadays. I mean, we can do a really good job simulating um, <laughs> more complex detectors, but uh, there is a very lack of there is lack of tools for simulating lab detectors. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people have, who have done that, but uh, we find that the uh, using the efficiencies for hexenolite charginos uh, do quite a good job. So, but um, fortunately enough, we, we don't find any constraints against because the cro production cross sections are much smaller. Um, so we find um, no constraints uh, for charge mass splittings below 5 GeV. Okay. Now, um, uh, in the lower mass limit, we start you know getting close to one, but other than that, uh, we find no constraints. So. We then looked at uh, whether or not the LHC with um, uh, run one LHC has uh, constrained this model at all. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, LHC exclusive lepton searches, they place uh, very large PT requirements on their, 
on their um, on their leptons, and so that suppresses a lot. Uh, so no, so that li that yields a very small acceptance and basically uh, suppresses the, the 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 cross section of of this of this signal. But uh, uh, there is another channel that you can look at, which actually do, do not uh, necessitate a need of that the, the does not need high PT uh, objects, and except for for uh, a high PT jet coming from either initial or final state radiation, and these are monojet searches. Uh, but we find that the current monojet searches are not um, uh, very constraining, so uh, not constraining at all. So what we do is we look at whether a monojet search with uh, 14 TeV LHC can actually begin to probe the degenerate window through monojet production. So what we did is we basically scaled up all the cuts that uh, people at Atlas and CMS have done in, in their basic monojet searches. And uh, we um, simulate um, all the modes of productions of these two scalars. And uh, we veto leptons with PT greater than 7 GeV. So it's very sensitive to the degenerate region where you know the leptons from the decay products of the gauge bosons will be uh, very soft. And we require a missing energy of much above 1 TeV and not more than uh, two jets. So as you can see in the plot in the right, uh, using 3,000 3, inverse phantom bar not data, um, a 14, T of LHC, 14 TV LHC can uh, begin to have sensitivity for masses below roughly 70 GeV. And this is in order to exclude, but there is uh, not enough, there will be not, there's not enough data to make a, a discovery. And also this is very highly dependent on the on how you take care of your systematic uncertainty. So the uncertainties of the background, what we did is we vary them between 1% and 5% with the dashed line, with the solid black line being 3%. And we found that when the systematics are uh, very small, then you can have a very large um, uh, signal to uh, square the background. But again, these are m probably very unrealistic uh, expectations for the background. So we will have to really wait and see uh, what the LHC uh, that's about this. Um, so that's basically LHC. Um, uh, what I want to mention now is that uh, there could be an improved sensitivity if you, instead of requiring just one mono jet, uh, you uh, you do demand an additional soft lepton from the H plus or the ADK, uh, so from the gauge boson, right? Uh, and um, the, you can you can actually do that, and also um, for small mass splittings. And another way to look for this guys is if in a very uh, degenerate window of neutral mass splittings, uh, the A to H Z star uh, decay will be uh, displaced. And I show you the plot of uh, displacements. Um, so and this C tau should be um, less than one millimeter. That was a mistake. And uh, People have also um, looked at this in a very general way, and it would be good to actually recast these results for the for the inner Dublin model, which we didn't do. Um, so now, uh, um, but a, a naive a naive expectation is that both scenarios will be unlikely because again, uh, both uh, leptons from the Z decay or from the decays of an H plus or an A decay. In the in the prompt or displaced uh, scenario, will probably be really soft. And there there have been studies on on, on uh, you know how soft these decay products need to be in order to be probed at the LHC. And um, uh, you can take a look at them. Um, but we find that with the run one at the LHC, you really cannot do uh, uh, much about. Uh, you cannot increase the sensitivity by requiring soft leptons. The acceptance just goes down too much. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about future colliders, and this is where you can actually expect to probe um, uh, these models. Uh, uh, to probe these models, I, I show you that with the 14 TeV LHC can do it, uh, but you'll need a lot of luminosity and you need very small systematics. And then a 100 TeV proton proton collider um, has been shown to surpass current LHC sensitivity to electroweakinos. So, because these models are very similar in their in their phenomenal in their phenomenology and their final state products, that you can expect also a, a, an enhanced sensitivity on the inner doublet model. 
okay? And here, sorry, here what I've shown is that with a, with a monojet search with a 100 TeV proton-proton collider, um, bearing again the systematics between 1 and 5 percent, you can start probing masses uh, or excluding masses all the way up to almost 200 um, GeV, okay? And you can have a 5 sigma, you know, discovery uh, uh, already at 160 GeV. So this is actually using a very large emitting energy cut of 5 TeV and uh, using lots of luminosity. And I don't know how, how fast uh, the luminosity at a 100 TeV collider uh, can be accumulated. But you know people are actually studying in, the, in depth uh, a 100 TeV collider right now. And it's actually something that might happen in the future. So it's actually a good thing to keep an eye on this. But again, I know we need to be careful about the systematics and see what uh, you know the, the, the experimentalists can actually do. But you know, five percent systematic might be too small as an expectation for now. Um, another thing that we can do is we can uh, look at a, an international linear collider, so a, an a E plus E minus collider. And uh, people, what people have done already is. Um, is they have looked for uh, similar uh, they have looked at similar models to the inner Dublin model and they have made projections so um, the authors Choi Han Malowski Urbiecki and Wang what they did is they study a very particular limit of the MSSM where you know you have you have a, a very nice doublet in the MSSM uh, which is the left-handed slept on doublet and um, if you arrange your couplings and you put in additional D terms so that the mass splitting is right enough, then the S neutrino can be lighter than the S, S electron or S muon or whichever one you want to uh, have as your lightest one. And you can make the following one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. So the S neutrino is basically a linear combination of H plus I A over square root 2. And then L tilde or the S lepton is basically your H minus state. Um, in this model, you also you also you also set up to to have this this particle this this doublet have only direct couplings to gauge bosons, which is what you have in the inner doublet model. And um, um, what these authors saw is that you can have an exclusion or even a two sigma reach of about up to a, an exclusion up to 160 GeV or a reach up to 140 GeV for H plus H minus H A. Uh, using 500 inverse Fentobarn and uh, center of mass energy of uh, 500 GeV. Now this 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 app uh, as this projection uses polarized beams. So again, we will have to see uh, if an ILC is actually something that's going to happen and uh, what kind of um, collider, what kind of what kind of beams are going to use. And well, the more work needs to be done uh, once um, we know exactly you know, where we're heading, whether we're heading for a very large energy proton-proton collider or a smallish energy, uh, high luminosity, uh, very clean E plus E minus collider. So again, all this, um, what I want to say is that all, all, this, all these models and all these different limits of these models, which, you know, are natural in a way, you know, they're um, very good motivation to study because uh, they 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 give momentum to to whether or not uh, these high energy colliders might might be a reality right after the LHC stops taking data. So let me just summarize. So what I've shown you is that mass degeneracy in the inner Dublin model can arise in the presence of a plux approximate global continuous symmetries, and some of the symmetries are actually very uh, well motivated, such as a Petri Quinn symmetry in the case of um, the scalar and the pseudo scalar. Or a an SU2, which is part of an enhanced custodial symmetry of uh, a beyond the standard model scenario, like in that tablet model. And we know custodial symmetry is very well approximate in the standard model, because that's what we observe. So any model of beyond the standard model physics should have some uh, custodial protection to protect the standard model gauge bosons from uh, becoming much more degenerate and unphysical. So these limits are actually very, very well motivated. Um, I've shown you that uh, light electroweakly charged scalars compatib are compatible with electroweak precision data, peak physics and dark matter experiments. So even though you might not be able to uh, produce the right relic abundance that we observe today, uh, 
it's clear that co uh help you not producing too much dark matter. So whatever model of new physics it's out there, and, 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 and if we do observe dark matter in future uh, experiments, then we know that this inner Dublin model has to be compensated by more new physics in order to account for the right uh, dark matter abundance. And then maybe I want to make a side comment. Uh, people have studied the, the, the inner doublet model or two Higgs doublet models in general with additional Higgs multiplets in order to address this diphoton axis. And, uh, you know, um, some of these extensions can uh, help you uh, maybe achieve the right relic abundance of dark matter. And then we will have to wait and see uh, this summer uh, to see whether or not this diphoton axis is a reality. And then, you know, you can actually extend uh, these this models of, of physics, which are really nice and well motivated to account for this new physics. So again, so if the diphoton axis is a reality, then we should expect more physics than just uh, a singlet scalar or pseudo scalar, we should expect maybe vector like fermions. We need a dark matter candidate, etc., so on and so forth. So these are very exciting times. Um, we have also shown you that we found no direct constraints on masses above mz over 2 uh, for charged neutral mass splittings below 5 GeV, and this is because. Um, uh, now, this is because um, the, 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 the z decay is a very the set decay bound is a very strong constraint, so you want to stay above that. Um, and then current LHC data is not sensitive, but uh, projected LHC 14 uh, will need a lot of luminosity and very small systematics. And uh, future generation colliders do appear to be more promising, and it, it will be good. F uh, so I guess one, 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 one direction of research should be really uh, proposing uh, well-motivated search strategies to look for these particles. Uh, you know, um, we, we, we've recasted, well, we've looked at a model that basically maps into the inner doublet model, but um, it is not. It's a supersymmetric model, so uh, uh, we're, we're actually working on whether the inner doublet model, uh, we're working on a complete analysis of the inner doublet model um, uh, for future colliders. So with that, I want to uh, thank uh, the organizers for um, for, for the opportunity to present uh, in the Latin American webinars of physics, and I look forward to uh, hearing some of your work in the future. Okay, Alejandro, thank you very much. So I guess it's a very, very interesting talk, in fact. Thank you, thank you. So I think it's time to for people in the, that are participating in this Hangout uh, session that if they want to make some questions, just I just I want to tell to the people that I is following the streaming you know, or that you can make questions uh, through this system of the in Google Plus the Q and A or, uh, or through uh, Twitter as well. Then if you later you are watching this video in YouTube after the, the the webinar you can also leave comments and make me and make some questions that we can try to address later to the to the speaker. So for the moment, who has questions to Alejandro from the, here in the session? So I do have one. Yes, please. Um, Alejandro, when you talk about the dark matter, you show this plot. I, I can go back to. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm. The, the dark, the relic exactly. abundance. For instance, this one, yes. So in the okay. right panel, uh, the curve, I know it's colored, is like greenish. The lambda L equal to 1, so on the, on the right. Sorry, sorry about that. Can you repeat that again? So in the the right panel, so you have this uh, greenish curve, the one corresponding uh -huh. to lambda L equal to one. Yes. So there's like a, okay, you talk about these two funnels, but there's mm -hmm. a, like a fourth one at hundred and something. Is this the addition into a couple of pieces or what's that? Uh, yeah, it should be actually okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that because last panel, it, it, it only shows up in this for this line, but not for the other two. It just, just because the, the coupling, the lambda L is too small, I guess. Yeah, for the other one, for the lambda, yeah, for the lambda L is too small. Then there is because it the lambda L is basically the the the, the coupling constant that basically um, controls the 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 annihilation. So. 
So that line, it's 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 uh, an additional funnel, and, and that you can see more when, when yeah when the when the when the coupling constant is much larger. Yeah. Okay. See, this is the one that's a little bit above 100 GeV, right? Yes. Yes, it could be. Higgs. Yeah, this is um, that's the. Um, yeah, the Higgs funnel, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and relation to a couple of Higgs, I think. Yeah. Yes, that's to a couple of hexes, yeah. Okay. And in next slide, when you okay, talk about next. the regular detection. Uh huh. Okay, no, next one. Okay. Yes, yeah, so again, the right panel, you have this box. What's mm -hmm. that? I don't know if you comment or I just. Ah, uh, no, sorry, I didn't comment on that, but. You know, like I, I mentioned in the in the beginning, that even though we're looking at the degenerate window of this model all the way up to 1,000 GeV masses, uh, because because the LHC with with the energy that we have now, uh, more, more, it's more likely to probe uh, lower mass scales. Uh, we, we we were focusing really strongly on masses above MZ over two and below 100 uh -huh. GeV. But again, I mean, if you really want to 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 account for all the dark matter. You really will need uh, much larger masses. So it's just um, it's just a, a box to show you that with a small enough lambda l, you can be consistent with direct dark matter detection limits okay. in that window. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So are there there is someone else? Has a question because also I, I want to. I mean, I want to start with my question in the sense. Uh, in the beginning, when you were talking about this, that you can promote your set two to an SU one. I mean, to a U one or SU two symmetries in order to uh -huh. make more, more 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 interesting the, the the model. Is it possible that you can do the opposite to to start from a SU SU two custodial and then you break it and you finish with a set two that protects dark matter to decay? I mean, I don't know if you can comment about that. Or no, no, yes, yes. Can so, the, the, you can do exactly the opposite. So you can think of this U1 symmetry and SU2 symmetry as parent symmetries that do break and leave you a remnant Z2 symmetry, which is unbroken. So that will, in my opinion, that would be the more natural way to embed a model like this, right? You start with a larger global structure that is well motivated by, by what we see and you know, by by, you know, by physics as a whole, and then you arrange for it to break. Well, it will break, but to leave this at two unbroken. So basically, just arrange for the coupling so that H two doesn't get a bev. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, but I have another one in the same mm -hmm. line. So in this case, because the model, since it's a inner dark matter doublet, mm -hmm. it can be very interesting. This degeneracy in the case of neutrino physics, because there are some kind of models that are called escotogenic, in which you have okay. the same the same setup at set two symmetry that stabilizes the dark matter, uh -huh. plus a right-handed neutrino, and in that sense, the dark matter and the right-handed neutrino are giving mass to the to the neutrino, the attractive neutrino through loops. I mean, it's not a true-level process; it's a loop. And in that yeah, sense, yeah. if um, I remember well, or something like that. This kind of degeneracy, you can make some correlation or something like that with neutrino masses. I don't know if you are considered this. No, or I, am, I am aware. I am aware of uh, two Higgs doublet models to um, to do some sort of radiative seesaw, right? Yes, in this okay. context. Yeah, I am aware of that, but I I haven't actually looked at. Uh, so one of the problems with one loop radiative seesaws, I think, in my opinion, is that okay, they do predict many. Um, a larger, okay. So I, I've worked on on three loop radiative seasons. Okay, uh, you, you have a three loop. You already have a very small uh, suppression, and you have a small mass. So, but one of the problems I think with one loop radiative seasons is that um, you, uh, to predict a very small neutrino mass is actually pretty hard. But I've I've never looked at the two Higgs doublet model in the degenerate window and its implications for neutrino masses. So that would be an interesting thing to to look at and. And I will look at it. So, escotogenic, you call them, right? Yeah, escotogenic is one of the versions that I guess one of the first 
people yeah. that proposed it was uh, Ernest Ma. So okay. Kind of everything is from Ernest, Ernest Ma in, the, in this talk. <laughs> yeah, I will see, you know, if... if um, because there will be some interference, right, from uh, the two particles in the loop, maybe. And that will, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I will look at it, yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, may I add to this uh, point? I mean, we, we are looking at these kind of models, and um, you can have degenerate or not degenerate scalar. So it doesn't mm -hmm. change so much. I mean, you uh, it would change the parameters, but you can adjust these parameters um, again adjusting the Yukawa coupling um, so yeah so basically you can have the generate or not the generate uh, parameters I don't think this uh, is a significant difference between the two cases but are you talking about the neutrino, the neutrino physics now, or are you talking about the right, model? Right, or? in these scotogenic models, when you ah, have to okay. generate um, scalars or not degenerate scalars, um, I don't think it constrains, basically, this degeneracy, the neutrino physics. Um, I yeah, I mean, um, I, I think that, okay, I, th I think that maybe, uh, okay, so, I I I have to say that maybe it does, but again I'm talking I haven't looked at models, but um, just like with 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 B physics and K on physics, when you have um, new physics altering uh, some of these decays, uh, when you have um, particles that that new particles that appear at the same scale, uh, you tend to have interference among them, right? So. If you have two particles that are really degenerate and close in mass, they can contribute in at the same level the loop. And I don't know whether their contributions will constructively interfere or destructively interfere. But again, I don't know. So maybe you're right that that, that it doesn't have it has anything to do with with uh, the size of the coupling. But I will have to actually look at it in more detail to make a. a, a but I don't know. Maybe you're right. Yes. Yeah, in fact, just to, to make another comment in, in the, because I remember a, an article from, in fact, Diego is here also part of the session, mm -hmm. that in fact, in, in this kind of model like exocotogenic, they can have an effect of co-annihilation that is instead of destructive in the sense reducing the size of the annihilation cross-section, mm -hmm. they can have the effect opposite, that they can enhance the annihilation cross, I mean, let's say, instead of have more dark matter, you can reduce it. So uh, okay. like the opposite effect that you are having in your model. So uh, okay, yeah. I was trying to figure out if maybe you can cancel both effects at the same time, and, and instead to have a dark matter that is very low in your cross section, you can rise it or lower it. Yeah, no, that's a good uh, that's a good way. I mean, all these models need uh, saving in some way, right? Um, that the, the idea, in my opinion, like this is cotogenic model, is that you you want to save a and in a way that you predict other things like neutrino masses and stuff. So, yeah, like I'm gonna take a look at it, and then I'll probably bother you a bit and see if you have any comments. Sir, uh, uh, I don't know. People, I'm gonna check just the the Q and A if we have some questions. Just give me a second. And in principle, no, we don't have more questions there. But I do. I do have a little comment. Um, mm -hmm. if, if any, if any of the listeners want to, um, you know, discuss things uh, about this model or anything else, then feel free to write me an email or whatever. So. Um, just yes, we are gonna put in the description of the video in YouTube that uh, how to contact you. Okay, uh, great. I like that. Thank you so much. It, uh, they send us a message in private, and we can address in order okay. to avoid some spam or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Thank yeah. you so much, Robert. Another question. I mean, yeah. another other question is just a curiosity. Uh, how much you, because you talked in the beginning that uh, displaced vertex could be very interesting uh, mm -hmm. idea to, to, I mean, a strategy to look for this kind of model with high degeneracy. Uh, how is the status of these searches? Okay, so I, I worked on this uh, about a year ago, and uh, the status is uh, last year, late, I mean, the middle of last year, Atlas released a very, very in depth search on displaced vertices. I mean, 
they covered all of the spectrum. Um, so I think that this place, that that search will put really strong constraints on this model. If the displacements are above, let's say, I want to say one millimeter, maybe a little bit above that, and 20 millimeters. I think if if you have displacement, I think this model is pretty much ruled out. Okay. Um, with that atlas search. So I, the status on these displaced vertices is that they have done a really good job at ruling out models that predict displaced vertices. Um, to the point where, in my opinion, suppose the, um, suppose the stop is just very slightly long lift. Suppose that's true. Um, you can use a displaced vertex search together with, ex with existing prompt searches, and you can pretty much rule out all of the parameter space with it with enough luminosity. I mean, you don't even have more space to arrange the neutralino mass so that you can expect escape detection. So we should, we should really um, be, um, we should really be, how do you call it? We should keep an eye open on this next uh, generation of displaced vertex because they're doing a really good job. And in my opinion, when you have displacements that are, you know, in, in, in between 1 and 10 millimeter, they complement prompt searches. So they, they actually help each other out, okay? So I have a paper where I discuss this in, in really detail. So as long as the, you know, B tag inefficiency is large enough, as long as we can reconstruct vertices well enough, I think those two searches in the range of 1 to 10 millimeter complement each other really well, and they're going to start hurting models big time, including this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, because this this is a very clear signature, right? So you have a, let's say you produce an A and an H. The H is missing energy. The A will decay to an H and a Z, and the Z will decay to fermions. If the A is displaced, you will have to you just have to look for two fermions that are soft, right, and be able to reconstruct a uh, a, a secondary vertex, right? And th that search has been done. So. I don't know how soft the leptons need to be, how hard the leptons need to be, or how hard the tracks need to be, because you're really looking at tracks. But uh, that search is being done. So it's all about just recasting. And I think they will constrain this very much. Yeah. So in principle, it's, it's going to be a very good Yes, a very, a very yes. good thing. So we have a question from the Q&A that is from uh -huh. Diego. Okay. And he's uh, Diego Restrepo. He's asking uh, if there is any constraint for from long lip charge tracks. Uh, in, in at the LHC, right? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so um, again, so there has been a search for long lip charge tracks, um, and uh, there are constraints, and I think they place. Uh, so here you will have the H plus B long lift. Uh, we didn't consider that, so I think if the H plus is long live enough, yeah, it will be ruled out because there are constraints on charge tracks. Uh, that's I think I think CMS, sorry, Atlas did this search and CMS did this search. They both did this search. Um, now it's really hard to recast these things because you need a model. You need you need uh, well, you need to modify your PCA or else so you need to do a little bit of work, right? But uh, I think if you use naively. Um, Use the constraints from the LHC. Um, you you will rule this model out. But I get uh, and I want I want to mention that these long lift chart tracks uh, are searches that have been done, but they tag other objects. Okay, so you need to you need a trigger, right, to in order to 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 trigger on these guys. And, and in most cases, these are muons. Okay, so uh, but yeah. Now we didn't consider those constraints because, like I said, a, a, new, a charge mass splitting that is below one GeV in our framework was unnatural. So we consider only charge mass splittings of uh, above one GeV. Okay, but if if Diego wants some uh, a nice review on all the displaced vertex and charge uh, displaced vertices that have been done, uh, he can just look at my paper on long lift color scalars. Uh, I'm just giving you like my own marketing, but just look at the introduction. I don't expect to read anything. In the introduction, I have a summary of all the 
of every single search that was done to date with the ATV LHC. So there are there are constraints on charge tracks. Okay. Um, ha hello. Mark, Can yes. I add something? Uh, yeah. Maybe Alejandro was right. I mean, I looked at the uh, the formulas. I mean, when in the scotogenic models, you will have a destructive interference between the A and the H, the CP even in CP odd uh, scalar. So whenever when they are degenerate, the masses, the mass generating term goes to zero, and um, so basically you need larger Yukawa couplings as this as the mass splitting goes to zero. Uh -huh. And that's nice at the beginning. And then at a certain point, they will be too large, and you will have another other kinds of constraints. Yeah, you like, have perturbativity. Uh, gamma probably. and so on. So oh. basically, uh, when the Yukawa couplings reach values of order one, you will have um, leptoflavor flavor violating constraints. But okay. Uh, I think it's maybe it's a nice motivation to have them kind of degenerate. I don't know of the order of it, sub GV. Oh, okay. You can have basically a sub, another sub, a suppression which is stronger, which is what you wanted to, from the beginning, right? Yes. Okay. Models. Yeah, I'm so, gonna look at this. Um, if uh, if you have a what what what's the reference on the main scatogenic model? Uh, with man, so one, but I mean, I can. Uh, the, the formulas are are written in many places. I can send you. Afterwards. Okay, yeah. If, if you don't mind, thank you very much. Something, I mean. All right. Thanks for looking into that. So uh, very good. So I guess if we don't have more questions, I guess it's time to to stop the the broadcast. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Alejandro to to, be, to give this webinar. It was very interesting and with a lot of debate. So uh, yeah, perfect. So I guess it's it's time to just to we we'll stop here. So let me just to show the to the people the this stuff is working now. The just to finish the stuff and and people that is following us. That not to forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel in which you can uh, see all previous webinars. And I hope you, to see you all of you again in the next webinar. So see you next time. Thank you.